When I was 16, the thing that I was really obsessed about was geometry. Well, actually, of course, I was really obsessed about girls. But my social skills were such that I had about 99% of my time to be spent on geometry. I'm excited by both the theory and by the practical application. And the interface between the two is um, a lot of fun. So I actually got a phone call from the governor saying, was there some way in which I could help by designing an auction which would more effectively get money out to the, the banks and building societies that really needed it. I think the Bank of England was imaginative in saying, we need to get hold of a, one of the best academics in the world and get him to help us solve this problem. One of the nice things about working in university is that I can feel comfortable giving some of my time for free to institutions like the Bank of England and to government departments and charities and so on. There's always a tension between the very beautiful, precise theory of mathematics and how you take that to a much messier real world. But the excitement is trying to understand the real world, what's, what are the, really, the underlying forces, then seeing how you can mathematically model those and actually doing something with them. As the crisis that began in 2007 got worse, nearly all central banks found that they were lending money to the banking system not just against the collateral of very low risk securities, government bonds, but also against risky securities. So I originally started working for the Bank of England because the central bank was having trouble getting funds to the banks and building societies that needed them. I mean, it was the fear that these banks didn't have enough funds that were leading to bank runs. If we were planning to lend 100 billion in total, we needed to decide how much would we lend against gilts, how much would we lend against the riskier securities. This was a complicated problem in the design of auctions. TT cabinet, as you see it there, 50 up here, 60, 70, 80, 90, 90 pounds, any more than 90 pounds, what about that? 945. This is a class of problem that we'd studied before. Um, so, for example, seven years earlier, I had, with Ken Binmore, run the UK's 3G auction. We took seven weeks, I think, on that occasion. When you were worried about bank runs, you got more like seven seconds than seven weeks. So the question then became, how can we collapse that kind of process into a very tiny amount of time? 550 with you. Uh, we're trying to, to take a lot of bids from a lot of different people and pare them down to a simple aggregate decision. And the answer that I came up with for that was essentially to ask the bidders, that is the banks and building societies, tell us something about their preferences. In fact, enough about their preferences that I could then work out how a long multi-round process would work. And I could then plug in their preferences into a system, it's a very simple computer model, and spit out the answers and tell us what would have happened if we had the full seven week process. So what we do is we can represent those preferences in graphs in effect and then we can work with those graphs. What's really exciting is that geometry turns out to be very valuable in solving problems like the Bank of England and many other problems of resource allocation. If I am allocating a bowl of fruit and there's oranges, apples, bananas, grapefruit, grapes, that's five different kinds of fruit and so I'm actually going to need to work in five dimensions to cope with the fact that I need to express trade-offs, preferences between five different things. Five, 90. 90 I'm bid at 90 in front, five, 100. I would then be asking you questions like, how many grapes is an apple worth to you? Are you happy to have one orange on its own? Or would you insist on having a pair of oranges if you get either because you happen to have two kids and you really want to have the same pieces of fruit because you take home different pieces of fruit, they'll fight over it. 90. 90 pounds, any more at 90? For the so I'm starting off in five dimensions. Nevertheless, we have a clearly defined set of rules by which we can transform these pictures of people's preferences and understand, in the end, how to efficiently divide up this bowl of food. 600. 600. 
at 600. All done at 600. Thank you. I am now, with my colleague Elizabeth Baldwin, taking tropical geometry that mathematicians only invented about 10 years ago and using it now to work out how to more efficiently allocate um, resources to the Bank of England and um, the Department of Energy and Climate Change has asked us to look into how they can do what they're doing better and we'll be using those techniques there we hope. It would be nice if the government and others understood more the value of fundamental academic research and how really valuable it can be almost immediately in the real world. Thank you. So, all right. I want to explain to you what this new kind of geometry is used in auction theory. Okay. So before I get to auction theory, um, I want to start with an example. Okay. So that I will call rental harmony. Okay. So it's a, so suppose you have three people move into a house. Oh, is it on? Three people move into a house with three different rooms, right? So one has a big window, one has a big closet, one has a big bed, right? So they have to split up the rent, right? And say, suppose that three people value different rooms differently. Say, suppose that, you know, a rent total is 1,000, then the first roommate thinks that it should be split up like this, meaning that this is the price where she thinks that she would be happy with any of these rooms. So this is a fair division. And then another roommate thinks that you should split it up this way, meaning this is one she thinks she is happy with any one of these rooms, and so on, right? So three people, three rooms. And then the question is, well, how should we split up the rent, and who should get which room, right? So, so we're going to assume that if we have a price, if there's a way to split up the rent, so everything sum up to 1,000. Then one person, right, for each person is going to like the room that gives them the most surplus, right? Meaning that this person thinks that the first room is worth 300, right? If the price is P1, then the surplus for this person will be 300 minus P1, right? This is how much she saves by taking the first room, right? So then, you know, the uh, say, then, more concretely, if, if I take a price, um, 250, 300, 450, right? At this price, the first roommate thinks that, okay, if I take the first room, right, my surplus is 50 because I think it is worth 300 and I'm only going to pay 250, right? So I profit $50. Right, and then here again surplus is 50 and here there's no surplus. So at this price, the first roommate does not want the third room, right? At this price, the first roommate will be equally happy with the first and the second room, right? And then the second roommate will be happy, well, we're not like the first room. So, and the second roommate will like to take the second room, right? And then the third roommate will not want the first room, will actually want to take I'm sorry. Yeah, the other way around. Thank you. <laughs> the second roommate would like this room, right? Yeah, that's right. So this minus this, right? So this is the how much they like the room, and this is actually the price, right? So you maximize this difference. So let's see. And then the third roommate would like this room. And then you can, at this price, you can assign a room to a person so that everybody feels like they get a good deal. And they don't envy each other. Nobody feels like I want to trade a room with somebody, right, at this price. Okay. So the question is, does rental um, harmony always exist? Okay. No matter what set of preferences you have, is there always a price as which, is there <laughs> always a price and an assignment that makes everybody happy? So the question is, yeah, does there exist a price and Okay, 
so you can think about it. Um, and then let me have another example, which I will call stable matching with transferable utility. I think most of you are familiar with the usual stable matches, where traditionally it is phrased in terms of like N men and N women, right? So every man has a ranking of the women, every woman has a ranking of the men. And then a stable matching is a way to pair them off so that no two person will run off, right? So you cannot find a pair that will like each other more than the ones they are paired with. So in the usual stable matching, without this word transferable utility, in the classical case, um, there was a theorem by Gale and Shapley in 1962. They proved that it exists. So there's a little three-page paper that tells you how to do it. And then so stable match matching with transfer by utility is a little bit different. You can still phrase it in terms of n men and n women. And then for every pair, there is a utility. You can think of, you know, it is how much, say, somebody is going to give them this, much, this amount of money if they decide to get matched. Okay? And then they can split up the value however they like. Right? So such a matching and a way to split them up is called stable if no people will run away, get a bigger sum that they can split them up among themselves so that each of them gets better value. Right? So this is uh, in economics, they call it Shapley. So they studied this in 1972, so 10 years after the usual stable marriage, stable matching. So yeah, so the question is always, does it always exist? So, and if so, how to find them? How to find the stable matching and how to actually, how to find a way to split up the values? Right. Questions so far? Now I want to, I'll come back to these later. Okay, so if you are bored, you can think about these and yeah, see, you can find counterexamples or proofs of the existence. All right, so what is an auction? So an auction is, in the simplest case, you have one object to auction off, right? You're, one person wants to sell one single object. Right? And then there is an auction off. So you see in the video, these people are saying 900, 910, 920. Right? So the auction off is going to import the bids from the people. Right? And that's going to import um, the supply. So in the simplest case, the supply will be just one object. Right? In the more complicated case that we'll talk about, the su supply will be I have you know, 500 or oranges and 1,000 apples and so on. Okay, so it, it inputs bids and supplies, and it has to output the winners and how much they pay and the price. Okay. So in, in the simplest case of one object, one indivis indivisible object, then obviously the winner is the highest bidder. because every bit is just one number. It's how much I'm willing to pay for that one object. And then the price, there are two, um, the two common things that people do are either the highest bit or the second highest bit. Highest or second highest, usually. So in, the, in these auctions, so there are four basic auctions that people talk about in the literature. So for the simple one object option, you can talk about when people pay highest bid, they call it, um, well maybe, when people pay the second highest bid, they call it the ascending auction. This is, this is what you think of when you think of you know, auction where people are calling out number, they're going up and up and up until like, there's only one person who is willing to pay. Right, but then the price pay end up being the second highest bid, maybe plus epsilon, right? And the, when people pay the highest bid, this is called descending auction. 
So this is when they start out with very high price and lower the prices until there is somebody who's willing to pay it. Right? So you have ascending, right, descending, and then you can also have open bid and seal bid. So open bid is when everybody knows everybody's bid, and seal bid is you, you seal your bid. Right? So, so they have a different name. Ascending open bid is called English auction. This is what you saw in the video. Ascending seal bid is called victory auction. Descending open bid is called Dutch auction. And I don't think the other one has a name, but it's just called second pr uh, first price seal bid auction. So I think one of the first Mathematical theorems in auction theory is something called revenue equivalence theorem. Uh, this is part of the reason why he won the Nobel Prize in 1996, three days before he died. So he proved in 1961 that no matter what your scheme is, right, under some assumption that people are acting independently and they are rational, then the expected revenue is the same, no matter what you do. All right, so now, so this is just one object, right? What if you have more objects? So, so if you have, if the objects come in many different types, and then they are indivisible, so they come in integer quantities, how can you auction them off? You know, if you auction them off one by one, that can take a really long time, right? He was talking about, you know, seven weeks versus seven seconds. Right, so you may not want to do that. It's, it may be impractical to auction them off one by one. And that it may not truly reflect people's true preferences, meaning, you know, say maybe you, you want to bake a cake and then you don't want to buy the eggs unless you can also buy the butter, right? You don't want to try to bid them separately. You only, you want both or nothing, right? So you want people to, you know, be able to specify their preferences, right? So then, so he has a, this paper product make auction, so he described what he did for this Bank of England. So which I'll describe. So it is um, a way to, it's, it's a setup for the auctioner to take in the bids and the supply information and output the winner and the price. Okay, so this is one way to do this. All right. Um, So now we have goods come in n different types. And in integer quantities, so we cannot divide them up. Okay. So the <coughs> what the auctioner is going to do in the product mix auction is for every buyer, you're going to tell them for possible set of bundles, you, you ask every buyer to specify how much they like each bundle. Okay. So a bid right, from uh, Jay's buyer, right? this information is a function from a subset of z to the n, right? So every point in z to the n is a bundle of objects, right? A possible bundle of objects. And then for um, some subset of z to the n, so these are possible bundles that is offered to this, um, <coughs> this buyer. So it's a function from a to the j to r, okay? So it is reasonable to assume that, okay, it's reasonable to assume that zero is in there because, you know, maybe, I mean, buying nothing should be an, op should be an option, right? And then it's reasonable to assume that uj of the zero vector is just zero, right? Buying nothing doesn't cost you anything, right? I mean, you know, empty, empty set is worthless. I mean, this is like how much, this is called the utility functions. So this is how much each bundle is valuable to this jth person. And then it's also reasonable to assume that this function is concave. I'm 
I'm sorry? Uh, it doesn't have to. Maybe they're all the same. Yeah, maybe they're all the same. They, yeah. So just to, for, you know, for generality, may, maybe, yeah. OK, so this is input. And then you also have the, you also have the supply bundle, A. Right? So these are the input to the auctioner. All right. So what does auctioner try to optimize, right? So when, when the auctioner collects the bids and the supply, what is, what is he or she trying to achieve? Right? How, how do you pick winner and how do you pick the price? So something the auctioner is trying to achieve is something called comparative equilibrium. So this is a place when everybody is happy. So comparative equilibrium, also called Walrasian equilibrium. So Walras is a French, I guess, economist. Um, so he developed the theory of something called Walrasian economy, where people are trade places. So people bring objects to a market that they want to buy and sell. You know, you are a peach farmer, and you buy a truck of peach, and you want to buy some beans and you know grains and so on. And some other people have some other thing, and you want to. You, you, some, you want to buy something, sell something, and then what should the price be so that at the price when everybody does the thing that they most want to do at this price, everybody does what is most profit, profitable to them, then the market clears. Then the supply is equal to demand. This is comparative equilibrium means. A comparative equilibrium means that it's a choice. It consists of two things, a, um, a way to set the prices and a way to assign the bundle to each buyer, okay, so that each buyer is happy, meaning that you know they get one, they get one of the bundles that maximizes profit or surplus for them, right? and then the sellers are happy because they sell everything. Right? Supply is equal to demand. Okay, so this is what the auctioner is trying to achieve. So what we want, yeah, so we trying to find a goal is find a vector of prices in Rn, and a way to divide up my supply into little bundles. Okay, so capital J is the number of buyers in our case. Some of these may be zero. Maybe some people will buy the empty bundle. That's OK. Right, such that um, Right, so if you look at the, for the J person, right, if you look at the profit, right, by buying the J bundle, right, it is bigger than or equal to the profit that they get by buying any other bundle, right? So for all. Okay. So this is what the auction is trying to achieve. It is trying to compute a P and compute this decomposition. So when this happens, we say that comparative equilibrium exists. So the question is, right, for which kind of auction, for which kind of setup, for which kind of AJs and UJs does comparative equilibrium exist? Right? So the question is, and then if it exists, how do you find the price and the assignment? Okay, now let's translate to um, a little tropical mathematics, tropical algebra. So you see that you know we're taking the maximum and so on. So, so one way to Look at this, is you have this bit. For each bit, let's try to cook up a tropical polynomial. So we have for each u, let me write f u j. Okay. So it's a tropical polynomial where these okay. 
bundles are the exponents, right? And then the coefficients are these utilities. So for every agent has a bit, right? Has a, and then we just write it, it's the same information, right, as a utility function. Right, as a function, right, as, as a function, this is the maximum of um, UJB minus B dot, no, plus B dot X, right? As a function, it's like this. Right? So that means that F of UJ f u j of minus the price vector is equal to the profit or the maximum profit of buyer j, the jth buyer. And then the term where the maximum is attained is the bundle the jth buyer wants to buy. If the maximum is attained non-uniquely, then the buyer will be happy with any of these bundles. Right? So that means that you know, we can look at the tropical hypersurface of this tropical polynomial that's going to cut up the space of prices right, into regions according to um, which bundle is preferred by which buyer. So let me draw this example of this rental harmony example. So uh, too bad I erased that, but let me write this down again. Say, yeah, suppose that the first roommate likes 300, 350, 350, right? So to represent it in a picture, so this is the space of prices, and then I'm restricting myself to positive prices, and then where the prices sum up to 1,000. Okay, so that looks like a it looks like a big triangle where this point means that you know the price is the first room is free, second room is free, and the third room costs one thousand, right? So it's the space of prices. Okay. And then the first room, eh? so this means that at, uh, there is a price somewhere. Right here, so this price is at this point where she will be happy with any of these rooms. Right. And then if the price is on this side, then this is when the second room is cheap, right? So she will like the second room. And this is when the first room is cheap, she will like the first room. And then prices on this side, then she would like the third room. Okay. So um, for the, the third roommate, 200, 300, 500, it is somewhere over here. Ah, uh, okay. I did not draw this right. So this is this is 350, 350. So this person thinks that um, the second and third room are the same. So the preferences are going to look more like this. So he doesn't care about the same one. Both second and third room are free. Then she doesn't care which room she takes. And then the last one was what I drew before. OK. So when you look at this picture, there is a tiny region of prices over here when everybody prefers a different room. Okay, so this is the equilibrium prices that we're looking for. Okay. 
So the question that I was asking is, no matter how you arrange these three tropical hypersurfaces, is there a region dual to the subdivision of the sum of three simplices, right, normal to the vector 1, 1, 1? Okay. So right here, dually, I'm going to have, right, so each roommate, uh, so let me, let, me, let me draw the, the dual, triangulation. So in this case, I have, um, oh, and then I also have to flip it upside down because of this minus thing. Okay. So, um, but uh, let me just draw the dual of, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so let me see. Let me just draw the upside down dual. So, all right. So uh, blue, purple, green. And then blue and purple is not generic. So this is both blue and purple. Uh, no, both blue and green. And then the purple. And then, okay, yeah. So this is the Minkowski sum. So each, in this case, right, each of the AJ. So in this case, as uh, Johannes was asking, you know, why do the AJs have to be different? In this case, they are the same, right? Each AJ is, uh, is a simplex, right? So it is just E1, E2, E3, right? So for all J. So each AJ is a triangle, which I drew upside down over here, right? And then this, uh, this information gives me a subdivision of the Minkowski sum. Right? So this is, this is A1 plus A2 plus A3. And the, the supply bundle in this case is one, 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 because there's one room of each type, right, to be, to be auctioned off. So the supply bundle is over here. Right? So and then the question is, is this dual, right? I mean, uh, is, is any of the regions, right, dual to here? But then if you look at the subdivision, as long as something is a vertex, of course there's a region dual to this, right? One, one something, where you will not be able to find a price is when this point, there, there will be supply bundle will be a lot of point in there that doesn't actually show up in the, in the subdivision. So let me do an example when that happens. All right. So let's look at this example. Okay, so this is an example where the AJs will be a little different, right? Say, suppose that, you know, this is the, you're buying, say, bananas, and let's say cups of these Brazilian fruits, acai, okay. Say, suppose that this person doesn't really like acai, no, actually doesn't like banana, like me. Okay, so, but she's willing to buy the acai, so it is, she's willing to pay you know, three rails and five rails for those. But then if she has like two cups of acai, then maybe she wants to make these nice smoothies and maybe she has wanted to buy a banana as well, okay? So maybe this is the first utility. And then the second person likes banana and acai equally fine, okay? So these are the utilities of two people. So then let's think about it. So is there a bundle? So oh, let's, let's write down all the bundles that can possibly be sold to these two people together. Right, so that would be, so this is my A1, and this is A2, and the, the numbers attached to them are the utilities. Right? And then if you add up A1 and A2, um, right, you're going to get these points. So these are the points that can possibly be, these are the supplies that can possibly be sold to these people, right? Is it, 
<coughs> so can, can we sell all of them? So for each of these possible supply, is there a price that, that makes everyone happy? Okay. Okay. So, so to, to review, what does it mean? So you take, you take your bid, you look at the subdivision induced by the bid, and then these cells are the, what they call the demand set. So at, at the price, right, at a given price, what you do is, um, well, okay, you, you take these ages and then you, you lift them to a next dimension using the utilities, right? And then if, um, and then if it, <coughs> at a given price, you, you take the dot product with one comma minus P. So given price P, you take one comma minus P because one for, one for this and minus P for this. So you are maximizing the, you're maximizing the profit, which is the same as dot in with one comma minus P, P comma minus one, depending. And then, so what you, what you find, the, right, the cells that maximize, right, they are cells of the subdivision. So if you look at this, um, if you look at this, well, maybe I'll show you the next slide, which is more clear. So here are the dual tropical hypersurfaces. Right? So if you look at the red utility and you have the red curve, the, so that divide the price into according to you know, what, what this person wants to buy and then for the blue thing. And then if you put them on top of each other, right, and then you can see what the total demand is, what the aggregate demand is. Right? So at the, at the price, oh, I have a, I think I have a right here, right? So over there, the price is too high. Nobody wants to buy anything. And then over here, right, the red person will buy, you know, two one, the, this point right here, and then the blue person will buy nothing. Yeah. So if you look at it, if you look at all these possible aggregate demands, you will see that one one doesn't show up in any of these. Right. So if you're a seller who has, who has one banana and one cup of acai to sell, you are stuck. Right. There is really no price that makes everyone happy. So now I want to talk about the main theorem. So uh, this was, I think, first showed up in some language in a paper of uh, Danilov, Kashavoy, Kash and Morota. So I have pictures of them, okay? So that if you ever see them at conferences, you will recognize. <laughs> so, oh, so I, I was looking for pictures of Klemperet, and I saw this. Um, <laughs> he, 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 it seems that he has given a course on economic economics in Korea, where he auctioned off a jar of coins for his students. <laughs> so um, anyway, so they proved, so these first, the top three people, they have uh, multiple papers. Uh, some subset of people have papers together. Murata has a book called uh, Discrete Convex Analysis, where there is an entire chapter on economics. Okay, so they, they so there's a theorem in the paper in 2001, so uh, right here in this paper, where this theorem appears, although without a proof, where for the proof they refer to uh, another paper of Daniel and Koshavoy, and then it seems that the paper came out as a preprint in 98, but actually didn't get published until 2003, so the, the dates are a little weird there. And then it seems that Baldwin and Klemperer rediscovered this last year in 2014, so they have been writing this up for uh, economists, and they have a very long preprint. All right. So what it says is that um, if you look at all the subdivisions, and if you look at all the edge directions, and you put them together, and if they form a unimodular set, then no matter what the supply is, competitive equilibrium exists. Well, not that no matter what the supply is, as long as the supply is in the Minkowski sum, then competitive equilibrium exists. I mean, you cannot sell like, you know, 100 banana to these two people, right, obviously, okay? So, yeah, so at, at first you may think that that sounds uh, a little restricting, right, because, you know, to, to be a unimodular, this is a super strong condition. It means that if you take, right, any n, linearly independent vector, they have to be a lattice basis for z to the n. Right? That seems quite restricted. But if you look at this Runter-Harmony example, 
right? So in this case, all these AIs, even if, if you have arbitrary number of rooms and arbitrary number of roommates, right, n people and n rooms, right, all these AIs are all standard simplices, right? And edges of standard simplices are in the directions EI minus EJ, right? And then those are also known as the roots of the type A root system, and they are known to be unimodular. So in this case, it follows from the theorem that if n people move into a house with n rooms, they will always be able to find a price that makes everybody happy. So everybody put down one bid, and then the, the, you can calculate this price. Right? So no matter how you rearrange these tropical hyperplanes, there is always a region, or, or maybe at least a point where everybody a point where you can assign a different room to a different people so that nobody envies each other. And also, in the case of the, the stable marriage with transferable utility, in that case, uh, you have to think a little harder to set it up as an auction. In that case, what you do is each of the N men and N women, each of them is a product of their own. So you have one object of each product. So you have two N product. You have one object of each to sell, so your supply is an all one vector. And then each agent, so they are going to be n times n agents. So for every pair of matching, you make an agent. And then the agent is going to buy either nothing or buy the match. Okay? So in that case, for the, for the stable match, right, so you have the, the bundles are in Zn cross Zn, and then you have the agent for each pair ij, where the utility is just, you're just sending the zero vector, or Ei Ej, right? and then the utility is just sending you know, zero to the no match, and then when they match, they get whatever money they are promised when they match, right? Value of the match. Right? So in this case, well, I mean, all these AIs are just edges, right? So no matter what the values are, right? So the subdivision is just a trivial one, right? And then all these edge direction together, well, they are these vertices of products of simplices, and which is also known to be unimodular. So it follows again from this theorem that stable matching with transfer by utility always exists. Um, any questions? Yeah, so now I want to prove this. This is actually really easy to prove. Um, although, yeah. So one of the reasons that we decided to write this paper is that um, we couldn't find a nice place where you can go read a simple proof. Although. All right, so here we go. Yeah. So it means that, so comparative equilibrium exists, right? It means that for every, for every cell in the mixed subdivision, all the all the lattice points in there participate. Okay? So that means that dually, right, in every point, every price, right, if you look at the, if you look at the, <coughs> if you, you take the price and then you go pick up the demand set, you go pick up the demand set for each agent and you add them together, right, so you get all the lattice points. So let me draw that C as if, if at every, you can restrict yourself to every vertex if you like. So every vertex P, but every vertex of tropical hypersurface arrangement. So this is the demand set. That means that all the bundle, this, this is supposed to be big U. So this is the aggregate utility, this is aggregate demand set. All the, dem all the bundles are demanded together by all the agents together, right? It is equal to the, all the lattice points in the convex hull. That's what you have to show. But by the definition of demand set, this is always equal to 
the sum of letter dimensions. So if you go ask each agent at this price, which bundles are your favorites? So these are the letter dimensions. You add them together. These are all the possible bundles that can possibly be sold. Okay, so this is always true. This is pretty much the definition of this. And then because we assume that each of this UJ is concave, we have that each of these actually contains all the integer points in their convex hull. So this is convex hull. So oh, this is what we want, right? This is what we have. Okay, so then we have to show that this is equal to this, right? So this is the kind of thing that people who study lattice polytopes in connection with Torre varieties are very familiar with, right? So then it suffices to show the following, that if P and Q so if you have lattice polytopes, PQ with edges from a unimodular set, as directions, I mean, yeah, they can be dilated, that's okay. As directions from a unimodular set, uh, We have that you look at the lattice points in them and you sum them up. This is the same as you sum up the polytopes and then you take the lattice points. Okay, so this is what it boils down to. Yeah, so well, let's just finish this off. Well, one direction is trivial, which is, right, if you sum up the lattice points, then you get a lattice points there, and this is fine, okay? So for the other one, so let me make an example. Say, so suppose that um, I, I'm looking at, yes, my one polytope, so this is the one, one direction. And suppose I have another polytope like this. Okay, so these are my P and Q. And then I sum, add them up together and get something like this. Okay, so for every lattice point here, I need to find a way to write it as a lattice point here and lattice point here. So what you can do is you can look at the tropical hypersurface over here and look at a tropical hypersurface over here. Okay. Well, okay, so they are, they, are, they are lying on top of each other, like just, you know, touching over there. But then I can translate one of them a little bit. Okay, so I can translate them. Uh, no, I did, I do, uh, let's see. Okay, so, yeah, say for example, I can draw, yeah, I translate them like this. So that gives me a subdivision over here. So this is a copy of my original blue. This is my copy of my original red. And then these things. And if you look at this, what I have done is I preserve the edge directions, right? In this subdivision, all these different cells have the exactly the same edge directions as before, right? Because, you know, right here, if you just translate the tropical hypers, the edge directions are dual to the, to, the, to the walls right here, right? When I just translate, I didn't, you know, create new walls, right? So the edge directions are still unimodular over there. And then what I have done is split up my polytope into cells, and then the property is that each cell 
is the sum of phases of complementary dimension, right? So this is an edge plus an edge, right? So this is a point plus a two-dimensional thing. So is this one. And this is an edge plus an edge. So by doing this, I can decompose, right? So the claim, which I try to show from the picture, is that um, so for any point in the right-hand side, right, is contained in some Minkowski sum sigma plus tau, where sigma tau are phases of P and Q respe res respectively, of complementary dimension, and dimension of sigma plus dimension of tau is Then, well, and then these are the edges are unimodular, right? Because I haven't created any new edge direction. Because edges are unimodular, you can, if you prefer, you can think about, you know, change of unimodular, change of coordinates, or you can, so you can take the ed edges and increase them to make it a lattice basis, right? So you can just assume without loss of generality that they live in complementary coordinate subspaces. Right? Then Minkowski sum becomes very easy. You can identify the Minkowski sum with the product. In that case, then, so in that case, you of sigma tau live in complementary coordinate subspaces. Right? So then you can think of, um, <coughs> The Minkowski sum, you can identify this with product. Okay. So that means that if you take the integer points there, everything works out. And this is the proof. All right. Any questions? OK. So then, then in the remaining time, I just want to talk about maybe how to compute them. Right. So OK, this is nice one things are unimodular, we know the competitive equilibrium exists. In general, though, if somebody hands you, you know, these little a, j's and u, j's, the utility functions, how do you actually go and check that competitive equilibrium exists or whether, how to, how to find the equilibrium price vector, right? Okay, to review, what does it mean that equilibrium exists? One way to think about this is you have these little tropical polynomials and, <coughs> and then you have a vector and then you are asking whether in the product, in the tropical product of tropical polynomials, whether that term can ever be a term that attains the maximum. That's what you're asking. Okay. Well, if you like Poisson series, right, you have, you have you're given some polynomial with Poisson series coefficient, say, or, uh, you know, some coefficient with some valuation, and, you're, uh, and a given monomial, you're asking, can this monomial ever be a leading term in the product? Right, it's a pretty simple question, but to do it fast computationally it may not be too easy. Or in other words, if you like subdivision language, it's saying that right, you have these little subdivisions and then you have the you put them together into a big mixed subdivision and whether every lattice point participate, whether every lattice point is a marked point in the subdivision. That's what you're asking. Or whether a given point is a marked point. So here is uh, one way that you might actually compute. So this, uh, this is pretty much a translation of what we said over there. It is uh, competitive equilibrium exists if and only if the following optimization problem has a solution with integer coordinates. Okay? So it is easy to write down. What you do is you, took, you take all the edges, the, this possible set of bundles, and you put them together in a Cayley configuration. So which looks like this. So you take, right, you have all your, these little a's, and then you put all the ones here, ones here, and ones here, and zeros everywhere else, okay? So you put them all in a big matrix like this. 
And then, so this is the C that I wrote over there, right? And then each of these come with its own utility, right? So the bit, so this makes the utilities, this is my U. Okay. So then you have this optimization problem, you're trying to find a vector, dot product with the U, so that um, if you multiply with the, this Cayley matrix, you get this is a vector of all ones, and then this A star, forget about the star, A is my supply bundle, okay? And then with non-negative coefficients. So this is, um, why well, this is <coughs> some optimization problem, and then competitive equilibrium exists, means that there is an integer optimal solution. In general, this is hard. Integer programming is hard, so a special instance of this is a set packing problem, which is known to be NP-complete. So in general, we don't expect that there will be fast algorithms. Like, there will, not, there will not be polynomial time algorithm, but uh, maybe special instances like unimodular case when it is fast. Okay. And also, what if you know the competitive equilibrium exists? How do you, there can be many different, yeah? Sorry, so you have to check whether LP equal IP, whether, yeah. You have to check whether the, so, so linear program is always easy to solve, right? And then you have to check that the, the optimum of the integer program is the same as optimum of the linear program. Linear program means that Y can be any real number. Integer program means that Y has to be integers. Easier than what? Checking what is easy, checking whether, I mean, there can be, oh, I see, you, you're saying, what if there are more than one optimum? Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, you're right, Diane, yeah, that's right. So if there is only one optimum, then you, and then that optimum is not, not integer, then you will know it, yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, good point. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I was thinking of more degenerate cases. One, you know, like all the utilities are just zero, right? Then you're gonna have a lot of optimum. So all the utilities are zero, then maximize doesn't mean anything, right? Everything is an optimum. Yeah. Yeah. So that's right, you're right. So some generic cases and this will be, you can certify that the competitive equilibrium does not exist. Any other questions? Okay, and then even if it exists, there can be a whole region of equilibrium prices, right? So which of these prices should we pick, right? Maybe the auctioner is working with the seller, maybe, you know, the auctioner may <laughs> try to optimize the profit for Bank of England. Supposedly, Clampara, you know, helped Bank of England make like 300 million more pounds or something like that. <laughs> okay, so then, then it is actually solving in this case, this is a true linear program. Right? There's no reason that the price has to be integer, right? So, you know, so in that case, if you can solve this LP over here, take an optimum solution, and then go over there and set up this, um, this linear program. So what this is saying is, yeah, so you take, you take a way to, the Y is pretty much a way to decompose your supply bundle. Okay? And then you take this and then go set this up and then optimize the profit for the bank. So this is an easy problem. All right. So some open problems. So how about finding some other equation for existence of competitive equilibrium? So right here, as you see in the proof, right, what it boils down to is finding conditions when this is true. This is, this kind of problems are well studied by people in lattice polytopes, right? They are these, uh, conjecture, like ODA conjecture about smooth polytopes where P, P and Q are smooth polytopes, and you know, this is true and things like that. So it's possibly hard, I don't know. So yeah, so I think the economists will be interested in finding other conditions that will guarantee this. Okay. And then also, what happens, so I think in practice, they have few number of types of objects and many, many, many bios. So in that case, is there something, you know, maybe computationally good that we can say, right? Say competitive equilibrium can be checked for some smaller amount of information instead of the big one. 
right? And all online product makes auction. I don't mean eBay. I mean one online means that you, you have computed something and some of your data changed. So maybe you get new buyers or you update your supply bundle and then you want to update your equilibrium price, right? So is there something like unimodular theorem? Um, yeah, so how would you update your price? This is more of a, I guess, a question for computer scientists. How would you have online algorithms? So um, that's it. So thank you. I thank you and the organizers and Impa for this wonderful conference. And Stefan Simons, our founding agency. This is my collaborator, Nock. And then we have our preprint. So we actually put it on the archive, but I think the archive people didn't know how to classify it, and neither do we. So I think it is kind of put it, being put on hold, which is weird. OK. Um, and then I went to Georgia Tech Library to check out some uh, book in auction theory, and this is what I found. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. <laughs>